so Barb Sears, it's right over there, she says that there are two types of people. There are clipboards and wing it. Yes, I know that's a wing nut, but you try Googling wing it. <laughs> clipboards and wing it, wing it. So a clipboard is someone who plans, someone who is organized, someone who always is, is working to try and stay ahead of problems, right? And a wing it, on the other hand, a wing it is someone who kind of, they more go with the flow. You know, you picture a wing nut spinning on a, on a screw. They kind of go with the flow. They can improvise, adapt, overcome, the few, the proud, the marine. They can improvise, they can adapt. And, you know, when I look at my life, especially when I think of, like, my work habits, I tend to be a little bit more of a clipboard. <laughs> I, I really want to stay organized. I schedule out my time. Okay, Monday from 9 to 10, that's the time where I do scheduling. Da -da 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 -da. Do this, this, this. I block out my time to do this kind of stuff. I try to stay organized. I hate, hate, hate waiting to the last minute to do anything. Like if a project or a deadline is coming up, that idea of crunch time that's an atrocity to me. I hate that. Like, the, I try, I do everything in my power to avoid that feeling of just overwhelming stress. Like, I have 30 minutes to get it done. Oh, my goodness. I, I hate that. So I work ahead of time diligently to try and get it, get it done ahead of time. Because <laughs> I don't need that kind of stress. <laughs> so this week, um, as is my usual, I set aside time to work on major projects, you know, the two, and, the, and there are a few, but the two major projects I had to work on this week was, one, I'm giving to you right now, the sermon, and then number two, next week, summer camp, which is huge. I mean, so summer camp is huge in, normal, in a normal year, but this is like, we're almost post-COVID, so we had, I had to coordinate every single one of those students getting a COVID test within 72 hours of the camp. Oh, what a nightmare. <laughs> they're, all, they're all negative, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, so there was just a lot of things going in, and, but I was set. I had everything planned out. I had set aside time. I was working ahead of time. I was just plan, 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 organization, organization, organization. This was my ideal situation. And then, you knew it was coming, Wednesday at 6 p.m., I get a text from my wife, Sarah. And I look at my phone, and it says, Christian, I need you to come home right now as soon as you can. And so I just get out of a meeting. I'm like, oh, no. You know, you see that kind of text. You're like, oh, no, what happened? And um, so I get in my car. I call her on speakerphone. And I ask her, say, hey, are you okay? What's, what's going on? And she says, Christian, I feel so sick. Like, just a fever came on her so fast. She was, um, she was, she was like 102 degrees. She was, she was just nauseous. She was like chill, sweats, horrible. And so when you hear that, what's your first thought? COVID. COVID. And here I am talking without a mask. I'm just kidding. We'll get to the good part later. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, my, that was my first thought too. Oh no, COVID. And then you know what my next thought was? Well, who's going to preach on Sunday? Who's going to lead? Who's going to organize? Who's going to lead all those students on summer camp next, next week? If I get taken out by COVID, this cannot be happening to me. Like, I had planned, 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 and then, oh, the plans of mice and men, right? Oh, the plans of mice and men. If Sarah gets COVID, who's going to preach? Who's going to go to camp? And in that moment, all my plans went out the window. Every semblance of control that I had over my life just went out the window. And all I could do then was just stand there in complete humility, in complete surrender, in complete reliance and dependence upon my God because I had no idea what was going to happen. I had no idea how these things were gonna get done. I had no idea how the youth were gonna to get to summer camp. I could only trust that he is good and that his plans for me 
and his plans for us are equally as good. Yes. Amen? Yes. All I could pray in that moment was, your will be done. Yes. Your will be done. And it is from that place of humility and submission that we find the perfect posture for effective prayer. It is from that place of humility and submission that we find the perfect posture for effective prayer. So let's turn in your Bibles to Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10. So we've been in a sermon series called Prayer Matters, all about how prayer matters. So Jesus, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he gives us many life lessons, and we're in the middle of this series that's talking about what Jesus taught us about prayer, how we should pray. And these next two weeks, so today and next week, these are like the paramount, right? Jesus literally says to us in verse 9, pray like this. This is how you should pray. Instruction manual, here you go. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm going to stop there, even though some of you went on already in your head. Because that's for, that's for next week. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. And may your will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Now, the first thing I want to draw your attention to in this passage is verse 9. Specifically, may your name be kept holy. May you always be called holy. And I think what Jesus is telling us here is he is calling us that when we pray, we need to start the place we begin from. If we start from a place of recognizing God's character. We recognize who he is. And who is he? He is holy. He is good. He is powerful. And let me tell you something. He is a whole lot smarter than me. He is a whole lot smarter than you. He's got it all figured out. He's got all of his plans in a row. All of his ducks in a row. He's a whole lot smarter than us. We need to really recognize where we stand in relationship to him. Yes. You know what I mean? I think this is hard for some people because God is our friend, and he absolutely is. God is our friend. Yep. But let me tell you something. God is not your equal. God is your friend, but he is not your equal. God stands so high above you and me that when we pray to him, we come from a place of friendship, but we also pray from a place of reverence, deep reverence, understanding he is holy, he is big, he is good, he is powerful, he is dependable, and he is very, very, very capable of figuring it out. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's a differential between God and us. He is God, we are not. I can't go low enough it hurt my knee or something. And so when we pray, we pray from a posture of humility and an attitude of praise. A posture of humility and an attitude of praise. That's why when we pray, a lot of times we get down on our knees. We bow our head, right? This is a humble position. This is saying, this is like you're coming before a king. You don't stand eye to eye with a king. You lower your head. You bow before him because this is who God is. That We don't just do this because it's a religious thing. We do it because it's a posture of humility, a posture of dependence upon God. Please help me. When someone is begging for their life, what do they do? They get down on their knees. It is a, it's a position of you are more powerful than me. You are more powerful than me. We give God the honor that he is due and understand that ultimately, we depend on him for everything. Amen. You know, I think we're very quick when God doesn't give us what we ask for, when God doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we want, uh, we're very quick to question his character, to question who he is. We ask questions like, is God really good? Does God really love me? 
why would he do that? Why would he allow that kind of thing to happen, right? We've all asked those kind of questions. We use the results of our prayers, what we get, to determine who God is, his character, when really, in all actuality, it is who God is that determines the results of our prayers. It is because God is a good God that he answers our prayers in the way that he does, even if that does not come in line with what we want. Because I've prayed prayer after prayer after prayer sometimes, and God did not answer me in the way that I want. But because I know that he is a good God, and that is the point from where I start one of my prayer, I start my prayer knowing God is good, therefore then I can trust him more with my prayers. Then I can trust him more with my life. We say, when we start praying, God is good. God, I know you are good. That is a given. That is a fact of reality. That is not something to be questioned. And our prayers become more effective when we do that. Because it comes from, that kind of knowledge comes from a deeper relationship with God. It comes from just a place of knowing him better. Yeah. So this week, what, what I was just talking about with Sarah, getting that text at 6 p.m., that was not what I wanted, right? I didn't go through my day saying, okay, I really want, I really want next week to be thrown into question, <laughs> okay? I had my plan. I had my organization. I had everything figured out. I was praying against sickness. And yet, God allowed my wife to get sick in a critical moment of my life, in a critical moment of my ministry. Does that make God bad? No. If I say God is bad because he he disrupted my plans or he allowed something to disrupt my plans, that's the wrong mindset. God is good. And so therefore, he had a greater plan in my life when he allowed this to happen to me. Look at the story of Job. Oh my goodness. You talk about bringing, God bringing a person down from the highest heights. Job, Job was the most righteous man on earth besides Jesus. Said, it even says in the Bible he never sinned. Like he just he didn't sin. What? And yet God, in his infinite wisdom struck him down. He took away his family. He burned his fields. He allowed these things to happen. He brought Job down to a place of just utter dependence upon him because he's God. He's our maker. He, he's made all of this stuff. And Job, at first, you know, he was pretty good about it. He said, God, you know, you can, you can take my life. I've given my life as a sacrifice to you. But eventually, getting egged on by his friends, like, God's brought you so low. What are you doing? He got, Job basically turns to God and says, I have never sinned. Why are you doing this to me? Why, why could this happen? Answer me, God. I'm ready to stand before you, God. He basically, he made himself and God equals. <laughs> said, God, you need to explain yourself to me. And this is how God answers him. The Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. I hope I never have to answer God from the whirlwind. (laughs) He said, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's pages and pages and pages. He says, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and now you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together? And all the angels shouted for joy. Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness? For I locked it behind barred gates, the sea, limiting its shores. I said, this far and no further will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. And it continues 
And it continues and it continues sharing God's glory and really positioning us in a place of submission and knowledge of who God is. God is holy. God is our creator. Does the potter say to the does the, the, the pot say to the potter, why have you made me this way? Guys, we are human. He is God. We are not. And he is good. And he is good. And he has a greater plan than the here and now. So when God allows things to happen that seem bad to us, that seem wrong, he's got a greater plan in store. And I believe this week, you know, because Wednesday night, I was like, what good could come of this? But let me tell you something. Through this happening, God humbled me to a place where I can give a very different sermon today to you. Right? The sermon, this is my second sermon, okay? The first one is in the garbage. Because, and it was fine. It was, it was good, I think. But... God needed to lead me somewhere else. And I think he needed to lead you as a congregation somewhere else. And so he allowed this to happen. Amen? Because he's a good God. He's a good and gracious God. And he's in control. And I submit to him. I submit to him. Amen. And by the way, Sarah and my family are all doing well. <laughs> we, um, so after, after we found out on Wednesday that she was sick, she was really sick for about a day. And um, we got COVID tested negative, and we just had all of you guys just praying into her, and um, we think it was food poisoning or something, but she just got dramatically better, dramatically better over time. And we both tested negative, which is why I'm breathing on you right now, okay? <laughs> I can show you the test. <laughs> you, all were, you all scooted back a little bit when I mentioned that. <laughs> so when you pray... Pray with the understanding that God is a good God, and he does desire your best. He's holy, and let me tell you, his name will not be tarnished when things don't go the way you want. He's still holy, he's still good, and he still loves you. He loves you enough to send his son to die for you. What greater love is this than someone who would lay down their life for a friend? The greatest love. Just be prepared. Be ready as Christians for God to act in accordance with his good character, even if it doesn't make sense to you. Be ready because it will happen. It happened to me. It'll happen to you. We just need to be willing to trust in him. So Jesus continues this teaching on prayer, and he says again, pray like this. He goes back to verse 10. And he says, May your kingdom, verse 10 of Matthew 6, may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. And again, Jesus brings us face to face with surrender. Surrendering our will, our plans, and our agenda to God. Laying it on the altar before him. We're really willful people, aren't we? We have like our, our idea of how we think our lives should go. We're like, this is my will. I want this to happen. I want this to happen. I want this to happen. It's just like the Backstreet Boys said, I want it that way. <laughs> I want it that way. I tried so hard because I wanted to make sure that song wasn't like bad. So I, I listened to it and I, I like looked it up. I re did serious research on I want it that way. And I still don't know what the song is means. I don't know what it's about. It's incredibly confusing. <laughs> but it's a good song. <laughs> uh, I have a set plan. I have a set idea of how I want my life to turn out. Your I, I, me, me. I want all these things to turn out this way. So that so many times when we pray, we bring our plan and ask God to bring about our will. We set our plan, our will on the altar of prayer and say, God, may this will be done, yeah. right? That's how we pray. When really, when we pray, we should be asking God for his plan. 
and asking him, God, how can I carry out your will? So when we pray, we put God's plan on the altar of prayer and say, God, how can I make it come to be? Before we ask for anything, God, what do you want? What an incredible concept, right? God, what do you want and how can I make it happen? We think of prayer as just, as just like a way for like God to grant our wishes when really sometimes God is using prayer for us to like grant his wishes because it's, it's, it's a two-way relationship. We need to put him first, put his plan first, put his will first and say, God, here I am, send me. Send me out into the corners of the earth to do your will, your bidding. For your glory, use me to enact change. Because really, the world is not functioning in a way that glorifies God. Who can agree to that? Yeah, amen. It is not. So when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying in agreement with God's plan, with his initiatives, with his will for earth, with his will for us. We're praying, God, I want everything that you want to come into existence because in heaven, when God wants something, it happens. But on earth, because we are sinful, when God wants something, sometimes our, and, he, and he wants to maintain our free will, sometimes we get in the way. Sometimes the enemy gets in the way. So we want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're saying, whatever your plan is, God, I will do it. This week, I was reminded of the, of the story of Jonah, you know, Jonah and the whale. And if there was ever an example of a truly willful person, it was Jonah, right? So Jonah, Spark Notes version, Jonah was a prophet of Israel, and God sent him, he commissioned him to go to the land of Nineveh in Assyria and tell them this message, repent from your sins, turn away from your sins, or God is going to destroy you. Believe it or not, it was a message of salvation. Turn away from your sins so that you can be saved. And so Jonah, after hearing that, he looks toward Nineveh, and he runs the other way. He runs away from God's will. He runs away from God's plan in his life. Why? Because Assyria, because Nineveh, they're the country who burnt Israel to the ground. They're the country that pillaged and plundered and raped Israel to the point of destruction and sent them into deep exile. And so Jonah turns to God and says, these people destroyed my family. These people destroyed everything I have ever known and loved. And you want to save them? You want me to send me to be a witness to them? Nuh-uh, no way. And he runs the other way. And in that moment, we see God's will and Jonah's will juxtaposed set beside each other in opposition. And instead of Jonah coming into agreement with God's plan for Nineveh, which was good, a good plan, by the way, going into a country, an unchurched country, telling them you need to turn to God and be saved, that is a, that is a plan of love, that is a plan of grace that mirrors Jesus dying for us sinners on the cross. Instead of Jonah coming into agreement with that plan, he runs the other way. And what a picture of just our own willfulness and our own desire to say, no, those people deserve justice. Those people deserve judgment. But God had a better plan. I want mercy for them because mercy triumphs over judgment. And so... Jonah ran away, and through a bunch of circumstances, God brought him back, and Jonah preaches probably the worst sermon that's ever been made, that's ever been spoken. He says, turn from your sins, or God will kill you. 
all right. And then he leaves. It's literally, it's like a sentence, guys. And every single person in Nineveh is saved. They all, it says they put on sackcloth and ashes and roll around on the ground and say, please save us. Please forgive us of our sin. Every single person from the lowest pauper to the highest king becomes saved. That was God's plan for Nineveh. And it just mirrors our situation in our lives. But Jonah had to come into agreement with God's plan, even if it did not make sense. He had to come into agreement with God's will, even if it did not make sense to him. Why would God save such evil, wretched people? Because despite what people may believe, he loves everybody. And he's a good God. Amen. So when you pray... Pray from a place of submission to his perfect will. Set aside your agenda and be willing to change course, to enact God's will, to bring about his kingdom, to bring heaven to earth. Amen? It's all about trusting who God is and what he's doing here on earth. Let me tell you something. He's doing good things. And we need to get in line with his good things. So as we close, would you all stand? And with every every head bowed, every eye closed, how many of you today want to declare that God is good? No matter what situation of life you're in, yeah, and how many of you want to declare that God is good? Doesn't matter what he does, he is innately good. Amen. And how many of you want to submit your plans to him? and work to bring them about. Okay, all right. Let's pray. Jesus, we submit to you. We get down on our knees and we say that you are good. You are a good, good God. And your plans for us are good. And so God, we come into agreement with your plan, not our own will, and we say your will be done. And God, above all else, we say you are good. Why don't you repeat that after me? Say, you are good. You're so good, God. We trust you. We trust that you are good. Lord, bless these people as they seek your will. Speak to them in a new way. Give them new knowledge of your splendor, your glory, how you set the foundations of the very earth they stand on. Bless them as they go out into this week. In Jesus' name, amen. And while you're still standing, I want to just give you the opportunity to invite Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. And so, with every head bowed, every eye closed, is there anyone in here who wants to partner with God, who wants to say, I want to be saved. I want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life. All right, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see those hands. I see that hand right there. And if you're online, I tell you to raise your hand right now too. God sees you. Now, the way that you do that is you turn from your sins. Say, I don't want to live that way anymore. You turn to Jesus. Say, I want you to be the Savior of my life. I want you to be my Lord. And then you follow him. You let him lead. Let him lead your life. Let him change your direction. So for those of you praying this for the first time, or maybe you're recommitting your life to the Lord, let's pray, and everyone else will pray with you. So repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I turn from my sins. I don't want to live that way anymore. And I turn to you and ask you to be my savior. I make you my Lord, and I submit to you. And Jesus, I will follow you all the days of my life. Lead me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, would you please text RESTART to 97,000. And what that does is just it sends us a message and we send one back. Uh, It's basically a connection that's made. 
because we believe that Christians are not meant to walk this path alone. And so we want to partner with you on this journey. So please, would you just text that, and we'll be, we'll be praying for you for sure. All right, God bless you guys. Come on, can we thank Pastor Christian? Such a good, encouraging word. Pastor Christian, something I think you do so well when you preach that I love is that I feel like every time you preach, you are very to the point. It's like very challenging, but you do it in such a loving way that calls us up. So thank you for that. And I just encourage you guys, it's so easy to just go through church, we hear a message, that was good, and then we forget all about it. Like, remind yourself about this stuff this week. Let's be the kind of a church that lives what God is speaking to us. And we don't just hear the word and walk away the same. We hear the word and we walk away changed. Amen? Amen. Well, if today was your first time, or even if you just, you're just you newer to NFC and you've never done this before, will you just text the word GREET to the number 97,000? Uh, and that's just like Pastor Christian said. It's just a way that we just get a little connection with you. Uh, and we just want to let you know how to get involved, be a part of our family here. And uh, this is family, right? This is a family. And uh, in just a second, we're going to celebrate together as a family out in the plaza. We're going to have ice cream bars and popsicles. Invite you to just stick around for a few minutes. Just eat until you're completely full. And then go home and eat some more to celebrate the 4th of July. Oh, man. It's amazing. And if you're online, too, will you just subscribe to our YouTube channel? Even if you're in the room, if you're thinking about this later today, just subscribe to our channel. That way we just get the word out about what God's doing in this family and we invite more people in. Amen? Amen. Well, we love you guys. Happy 4th of July. We'll see you next Sunday.